Hi, ladies. Would you join us today in worshiping the Lord together?
as a follower of you, I want to be known by my, by my love, my love to others, my love to the people within the church as well as outside of the church, God. And I just pray as a, a body of believers that we would do that, and in doing that, we would glorify you. Lord, thank you for this lesson today. Thank you for this time together to sing. In Jesus' name, amen. Hi, I'm Nancy Isaac. Um, I'm blessed to be able to come and speak today. About a year ago, I was here teaching a lesson um, on a stage, well, on this stage, for the first time. And it was strange and weird, and I couldn't hug my friends, and it was awful. And that thought, those days, have been really coming over me as I've been preparing for today's lesson. We've been talking about everyday theology, that what you believe matters. And we don't have to guess because God in his infinite mercy and wisdom has given us scriptures written by many men over many years with one consistent message that we can trust. We've been learning about who God is, God who is three in one. He's Father, the Spirit, and the Son. And he created us in his image, which he is perfect. So when he created, he wanted something to reflect his perfection. But he also gave a choice, and the choice that was made in the garden by Adam and Eve was to sin. So we've tarnished that reflection. We've, we've put a veil. We've separated ourselves, or he's had to separate ourselves from him because he's holy and he's pure and he's good. But he sent Jesus. He had a plan from the first moment that he wants relationship with you and with me. He wants to save us from death. Not just the physical death, because we will all physically die, but from that spiritual death, a death that is a complete eternal separation from a holy and loving God. Darkness, aloneness, but he doesn't want that. He wants us to be with him. So he sent Jesus. When we accept his great gift of salvation, not only is our identity changed as an individual, we become part of a group. The group that is called the church, the body of Christ. Last year, everybody reevaluated what church was. When I keep thinking through what is the church, I have a little Sunday school rhyme that keeps coming to my head. So, Here's the church, here's the steeple. We open the doors and see all the people. It's not quite accurate because the church isn't a building. There are churches meeting across the globe. I have been in homes in China and watched baptisms in bathrooms. That was church in that place. I've been on a mountaintop singing and worshiping with other believers. That was church. And then I come here to the sanctuary to be with the people of Lancaster who love Jesus. And here is church, not the building, but the people. The people who have accepted Christ and his perfect gift have changed identity as individuals and as a corporate group. We become the church. The church is the body of Christ. He is its head. We are the church and we represent him that perfect image that he created in the garden, that reflection, 
it's becoming clearer as he's sanctifying us. And sanctification, which is the process of becoming more and more holy or more and more like Jesus, that process was never meant to be done alone. It was meant to be done in community. I am a huge fan of etymology. Etymology is the study of the origin of words. And one word, which we looked at when we started on day one in our study, was the word ekklesia. It's a Greek word. And it comes from two different words. The image you see here is from um, Blue Letter Bible. And it is the entry on ecclesia from the Vines Deposit Expository Dictionary. So the two words. The first one is ek, which is to call out. Or, I'm sorry, out of. So it's separated. And then kleo, which is to call. You like a clarion call. It's just coming out. So ecclesio is call out of where you are. And it's a call to something. This word isn't one of those words that we only see in the Bible. There are some like that. This word was used to describe a Greek community where they've been called to talk about the affairs of state. So when we see this term, the words church or assembly in the Bible, it's very frequently this people who are called out, who are part of an assembly. Now, I said before, Christ has changed our identity. Each of us who belongs to him are part of his body, and his body is the church. 1 Corinthians 12, 27, now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. So part of a group, but individual members over which Christ is the head. Ephesians 1, 22 to 23, and he put all things under his feet and gave him his head over all things to the church, which is his body. The fullness of him who fills all in all. We are the body of Christ. He is its head. We are his church and we represent him to the world around us. Our identity has changed. Our belonging has changed. I really appreciated when we were studying um, the church and that idea of one body in separate images. On page 173 in the study guide, we looked at the sports analogy and she referred to the church or the body of Christ being similar to a football team. I don't know much about football, but I know some people try to get the ball to the end zone and other people try to stop the other team from doing the same. Each one of those men on that football team playing on that field has to show up. They have to be present or it all falls apart. And at times, some of them are working harder than others, but they're all going to work hard. They have the same goal. And that's true in the church. The church is the body of Christ. Each of us has a different job. Some it's teaching. Some it's service. Compassion. Evangelism. They're all different gifts that God has given. The church is to be unified, but we're not to be uniform. We are not all supposed to look like the same person and do the same things. Let's go back to that verse from 4 Corinthians. Now you are the body of Christ, individually members of it. You have a role. When you became a Christian, if you are a Christian, you were made part of his body. You were made part of this team. 
First John is one of those books I keep coming back to again and again. And it says, God is love. And God, in this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world so that we can live through him. And this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that God has loved us and has sent his son as a propitiation for our sins. So many big words. Manifest. Christ was made man. He didn't. We listened to that when Margaret was teaching. She talked about what that means and how we can understand that, even though it's very confusing. Propitiation is that payment. He stood between us and paid the debt. It's done. It's resolved. And we've been given a gift of eternal life. So beloved, if God has so loved us, we also ought to love one another. I don't do that well. I need help, a lot of help to love well. In Romans, we're told to let love be genuine, to abhor what is evil, to hold fast to what is good, to love one another with brotherly affection, and then outdo one another in showing honor. This church is on earth, and it's not perfect. It's full of people. People are messy. God is in the process of making us more like Jesus, but it's not finished. It won't be finished until we stand with him in glory in the throne room. And because it's a process, we're going to stumble as individuals along the way. We will make mistakes, You'll make some and I'll make some because God is in the process of bringing us along. But even in those imperfections, even though we're messy, we still reflect the image of God to the world around us. So hold fast to what is good. Hate what is evil. Keep on loving. And when you mess up, ask forgiveness and love some more. He's done that for us. We don't have to live in shame. We can live in his love. So one response to his great gift is to love him and to love those around us. What then is the response of us corporately. It's worship. Worship, for a long time, I just thought was when we were singing hymns or choruses, but it is not. Worship is our response to all God is and all he has done. How do you respond? Every moment through the day, I respond to something. I'm thirsty, so I go get a drink of water. I've responded to that thirst. My child calls for me. I go. I'm responding to their call. God loves me. I need to respond. Worship is my response. It's living my life through his strength and loving. Even when everything's piled up on top, we can trust him. And worship. The appeal in Romans. I appeal to you therefore brothers. By the mercies of God. Present your bodies. Your lives. As a living sacrifice. Holy and acceptable to God. Which is your spiritual worship. God's work in our lives requires that response. And worship is the response. That's the word that our author of our study used 
to describe what that response is. Our responses of worship bring honor and glory to God. They say to the world around us, God is good. He is love. He has loved me. I will love you. That looks different for every person. You continue through in Romans, and it says, For as if, for as in one body, the body of Christ, the church, we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function. So we, though we are many, are but one body in Christ, individually members one of another. And this is part we're thinking about now is having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. So let's use them. If prophecy in proportion to faith, and as we keep going, he lists more and more gifts. But they differ according to who we are, the work that God has prepared us for, and the community we are a part of. God made us part of his body, of his church. He is the head. He knows what he wants. He wants us to become more and more like him, and he wants more and more people to know him, to know his name and know what he has done. So we've all been given gifts and as we ex- exercise those gifts, we are, that is a response of worship. Now, there's a variety of gifts, but one spirit. There are varieties of service, but the same Lord, and varieties of activities. But it is the same God who empowers them all in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the spirit for the common good. says varieties of gifts, varieties of service, varieties of activities. Same spirit, same Lord, same God. God in three persons, the blessed Trinity, he has empowered us. He has sealed us for salvation by his spirit. And then he manifests his power through us. He made it show up through the Spirit, and that is for the common good. We've been equipped and empowered to use those by the Holy Spirit as we represent Christ to the world around us. Now, that all seems like individual responses, but it's not. It's something we do in community. We have to do that together. Everything we do reflects on Jesus. When we claim to belong to him, people look at us and say, okay, if she belongs to Jesus, does she look any different than her neighbor who doesn't? If I speak in the tongues of men and angels, but have not love, I'm a noisy gong and a clanging cymbal. If I have prophetic powers and understand all the mysteries and all knowledge, if I have faith so as to move, remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have and I deliver my body up to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. In Galatians, it talks about the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and self-control. Those fruits of the Spirit, it's one fruit. Love is the full expression of all of those things. I don't want to be a clanging symbol I don't want that. I don't want to have nothing at the end. I don't want to gain nothing. I want to show love. I want to be love, and I want to love within the body of the church. So 
because that's what I want. How, how does it mean? So the church is the body of Christ. He is its head and we, the church, are his representatives. So as you ponder, let us consider how to stir one another up in love and good works. Let's not neglect meeting together, as has been the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. Hebrews 10, 24 to 25. So coming back to thinking about this past year, church, we couldn't gather together the way we always had. We couldn't see each other, but does that mean the church stopped? No, the church is eternal. We are Christ's body. We reflect him in everything we do. And as a body, you've seen it expressed in new ways, ways that we hadn't expected before. That little rhyme that I started with, the here's the church, here's the steeple, open doors and see all the people. I found it um, an alternate version from, and it says, here's the church, here's the store. Open the doors to welcome all people. We don't want to be exclusive in our invitations. We don't want to be exclusive in our love because Christ was not exclusive. We are gathering together. Let's serve, let's worship, let's love. We're the body of Christ. He is the head. So let's reflect him well. Reflecting his glory as we act, exercise our gifts in love. And they'll know we are Christians by our love. I don't know. The church doesn't seem like it did before. It feels different. But it's not. Because it's not about the building. It's not about whether you're able to log into Zoom or not or if the YouTube video works this week. It's about Christ and our position within his body. It's the conversations you have with the friends who are close to you, who look at you and say, how are you doing? Are you able to pray? Are you reading your Bible? Let's see how we can serve together. Have you gone and met the neighbors down the street? Have you spent time with them? It looks different. I know people who have stepped up in ways I never would have imagined. And then I've known people who are in a lot of pain, in grief, in isolation. And as part of the body of Christ, we step out into that. So I want you to consider, as we close our time, how, as a representative of Christ, how am I engaged in and through the church? Does it need to change in any way? Father, you have given us a tremendous love, a tremendous gift because of your love through Jesus. You've sealed us by your Holy Spirit. You've gifted us to do great works in your name. And you've called us to be part of a community. Help us to see our role in that community. Help us to love well so that when the world looks, they see you reflected through us. All glory and honor and praise to you alone, Lord. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of Almighty, who was, who is, and who is to come. 
Amen. As you go into your groups this week, I think go ahead and refer back to page 174, and there's a question there. I've kind of tweaked it a little bit to make it more personal and asking, how are you using your giftedness in your church? How is your church being the body of Christ in your area? As you consider those questions, reach out to the friends you have around you. Some people go to Calvary. Others are going to different places. Don't stay in isolation. Beloved, he loves you. If you don't know him, call out. Call us here at Calvary and someone will talk to you about what that means. Or talk to your neighbor who you know loves Jesus, but don't stay isolated. He loves you too much for you to stay there. 